<clears throat> what Oliver Stone movie gave Michael Douglas the line, if you need a friend, get a dog? Turner and Hooch? Falling <laughs> <laughs> down. Street. Falling down. Well, Morgan got the yeah. point. I didn't even see that movie. Oh my god. <laughs> that's, that's the best time. Turner and Hooch, directed by Oliver Stone, starring Michael Douglas. Oh. I, I was I love didn't hear starring Hooch. Hooch. Did you make a mess in the bathroom again? <laughs> I love to see that. And then his son is like the villain, so it's like yellow, that yellow episode from Tales from the Crypt. In the end, the dog rats him out, and he goes, he gets 20 years in prison. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best thing I've heard tonight. Oh my god. Let's make it happen. Let's do a Kickstarter program. Yes, let's do a remake and of the Turn and Hooch. And the surprisingly talk at the end is like, He did it! I saw it! <laughs> And it's voiced by Morgan Freeman for no reason. <laughs> no, it's voiced like but it's voiced like Tequila from Tequila and Benetti. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh. What? <clears throat> there can be only one. They're here. I have come here to chew bubblegum and kick ass. And I'm all out of bubble. Go ahead. Make my day. Cinema Royale. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Cinema Royale, where we do not fight about movies. We discuss movies. That's the whole point of this. It's not a Royale, per se. It's just a figure of speech when it comes to the title. I'm your host, Mike Mixtape, and we're kind of a little light here today, and it's it's okay, because Jada has te technical difficulties, her headset broke, so she'll come back whenever she has a new headset, and it'll be all good. It's just the guys tonight. It's a guys' night out. Ah, uh, good times. Good times. Night. Mike, is there, some, is there something you're not telling me about last <laughs> week? Because I wasn't here. <laughs> all I remember is that there was a whole battle between American Tale and Land Before Time, and if I was in that mix, I would sell it all out with Land Before Time, and say, shut up. Moses Dinosaur Story is more uplifting than depressing mouse in New York trying to find when his family. When did that happen? Did I miss That was James something? Horner, remember? Oh, the James Horner yes, episode. Was... I don't think... We... Did we discuss mm -hmm. an American tale? I, I, be I, yes, I believe did. Jada brought that up as saying that had a better score than Land Before Time. I just, I <laughs> he's only in a daze. It's like, I don't, I don't fucking know. remember that. Most of, I don't know, most of what it says just... <laughs> I barely remember the score for American Tale. <laughs> Aside from somewhere some out the there. Yeah. Going to Alphabelka order, the, the, my fi film fish shadows include James Sullivan, also knows Jaime Tude. Tonight's broadcast is brought to you by Alvin and the Chipmunks because I sat down and watched Alvin. I've and seen the that Chipmunks too. Just to here, here, come here and say that I saw Alvin and the Chipmunks. <laughs> really? What? Whatever happened to Oliver Stone's Turner and Hoop? <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was going to be the opener. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been a great opener, James. What the hell? Got Alvin and the Chipmunks. <laughs> Because I can't say it, because I, I can't say the title without, without going, Alvin! Oh, no. it's, it's, I saw it too, James. I was watching a couple episodes of that, and I was like, what the fuck is this? I, you know, funny enough, I've read an article regarding how, like, like the like the people who brought it in, like, the son of the original uh -huh. creator kind of gave it such disrespect to his father when it comes to that show, mostly putting his name instead of his dad's. Oh. Funny enough. Like, because, like, they did a oh, comparison to how, insane. like, Blue Sky is taking care of Peanuts the movie, and then you got Alvin, which there's no mentioning... Uh, like, did they mention the, like, the original creator's name at one point? Like, based on the characters of uh, this guy? I don't remember. It's like, his son... And his daughter-in-law pretty much took over. 
And considering, and it's not really surprising, considering the crap they pulled out with the with the freaking movies. So yeah, it's it's because I'm watching it, and of mm-hmm. course, the theme is the original '80s Elvin cartoon. They didn't change the theme. It's the same theme from the '80s, which is weird. Like the same the, theme? the '80s theme, the theme from the '80s cartoon, the same. Yeah, really? so I'm watching. I'm like, not like, like I'm a like, modern like, version, like. I'm sending the adorable. Yes, the same exact one. I was like, didn't they not, not create a new theme song for this? It's like, okay, they're rebranding the show, but <laughs> it threw me off. It's like this. This is not the '80s. This is not the '80s cartoon. Damn it! Yeah, the designs in this show are weak. I mean, something. Okay, the good I can say is that at the heart of it, okay, there's still Alvin, Simon, Theodore, and Dave. Um, the the meh is the the designs because I can't. They're so weird. It's like it. it it's like uh, it. It's anime and spy now or something. They look like they look almost exactly like human children, only smaller with little, little tails. Yes, it's it's so bizarre. Yeah. Uh, and and it's not like they look like kids much to begin with. I mean they. Or chipmunks, or, or whatever. They really they, try. They like used to I, look I, like I, just hairy little children. <laughs> yeah, I, I I remember they tried really hard. They they try really hard to try to update it, like to update the show to make their own thing. But it's just no. This is just weird. Like because they're supposed to premiere it in March of this year, but they had a delay until this month. Mm. We know why now. Mm. It, it's a. <laughs> It's weird because it's it premiered in France first, and then the U.S. France, France. Those damn French people, I dare ya. Anyways, anyways, just a little brief discussion about Alvin and the Chipmunks. So if you guys want to check it out on Nickelodeon, I don't <laughs> think so. Alvin. Yeah, they get we get Alvin, and yet we still don't have that goddamn Coneheads Saturday morning cartoon we were supposed to get from Rankin Bass. Seriously, there's like tons of leftover scripts that weren't touched. Ooh, just... <laughs> that was a long time that ago. That was a though. long, long time yeah. ago. Anyways, the man... <laughs> We're talking about ranking minutes. That was... <sighs> the uh, the man in the middle this time is Matt Bernays, known as Anime... At... Hello, Cinema Royale! <laughs> so how are we doing? Hey. And there was much rejoicing. <laughs> and returning to Cinema Royale again is Morgan Ledger. Yeah, two more days and I turn the big 25 on the 25. Happy birthday! Happy birthday, holy crap. Oh boy. Now I might as well mm-hmm. get the full disclosure out of the way. No, I'll save okay. it for later when we're okay. talking about our okay. choice of films. Um, but no, yes, I'm turning 25. It's great to be on this planet. I hope I go on for like 50 or 70 more years. Let's hope so. That's a good. That's a good time slot. They've seen good movies. They've seen bad movies. But hey, it's been a good life it's so far. It's been a good, good life. Good life. Oh, it's gonna be a good life. Gonna be a good life. Happy early birthday to me. (laughs) Happy early. Happy early me. I get get to do a a podcast with you guys. This is good. Mm -hmm. This is an early birthday gift. Ah, this discussion of this topic. 0% films on Rotten Tomatoes. Rotten Tomatoes is one of the suggested or clear choice for when to look up movie info or, you know, what movies you want to see, what ratings and all that stuff. Critics be like, I like this movie, I love this movie, I hate this movie. So there's a big, huge 
bunch of movies that have zero percent either whether it's no no reviews or a lot of reviews like most of these films on the list don't have a lot of reviews and there's only one film on the list that we are not going to talk about that has the most reviews but that's another discussion at another time is it the Can master it, disguise no. uh if no. actually if you want to know i'm uh, sorry i just want to uh, guess what okay it oh guess uh, like... <laughs> just kidding Go on. Anyways, uh, I just want to clarify something that a lot of people, I, I, I do feel a bit like a lot of people kind of misinterpret, like, the point of Rotten Tomatoes. Like, usually when they see a rating that is, like, the percentage and stuff like that, a lot of people interpret it as if the movie is good or bad. Like, it, it, in a way of, like, is it going to be, like, the movie is 90% good. That's actually not the case. The whole point of Rotten Tomatoes is the percentage of, of uh, how many critics agree. So if you see a movie movie that has like 70%, they would say like, uh, like a movie with 75%, they would say like 75% of, of, of critics say that it is good. Where if you see a movie that has like 35%, then they say that only 35% of critics say it's good. It doesn't change the fact of how, like, the score itself would be. So, like, per se, mm -hmm. like, if you see the Lego movie, it like, it's one of the major ones that has 98%. That doesn't mean it's 98% good. That only means, like, 90% of critics agree that it's good. They just gave it, like, an 8 out of 10 rating. <laughs> That's the major thing this, about Rotten Tomatoes. Rotten Tomatoes, yeah. Yeah, yeah that... The critics that they picked that particular case gave it gave it that type of approval because see at the what you also have to remember is it, if they were if each individual critic were rating every movie out of out of ten and anything was over five that's considered a positive in their in their group but if it's under five say four then that that means it's bad and uh, and um, it sort of give if there's just every yeah, yes if there's a uh, critic out there that reviewed this thing that says okay it's it's over five you know it could be a little it's like average. if it's six it's then it'll, like it'll get a fresh rating yeah and that's and that'll and that that's what gives these some of these movies a 98 or 99 ridiculously high positive rating like oh my god this movie's great go see it and then if these movies get a little bit less than 5 um that uh, then it's the exact opposite direction for example but it gives you the impression that there's nothing there's nothing uh, salvageable about it if it gets zero percent and that's not necessarily true for example the film i could mm -hmm. have chosen has a zero percent and the audience score is 28 percent the film i chose instead is at zero percent with the critic score the audience score 28 percent that is actually kind of eerie okay bad example um fantastic four the new one 8% on Rotten Tomatoes by the tomato meter of the critics. Audience score, 21%. So there's a big difference between mm -hmm. the scores, mm -hmm. so... Yeah, so pretty much it's, it's to say that, like, when you really get down to it, and when you really know how it works, it's, like, Rotten Tomatoes is not necessarily the most reliable right. source to know if a movie right. is good yeah, or not. Yeah. Like, like, I put it in the middle, it's not like it's not as it doesn't tell you as much as uh, Metacritic's, but still definitely more reliable yep. than IMDb. That's true. Masters, Masters of the Universe, seventeen percent on the critic meter. Audience score, forty-one percent. And sadly, I am the one percent. Yeah, so that's how the Rotten Tomatoes work. I kind of use it a lot, so I'm. That's that's my mm -hmm. thing. I use it all the time, and the. Uh, so just so just so everybody's clear and so everybody's curious to know what the most uh, reviewed zero percent movie is, it's from 
Where'd it go? It's 115 reviews from the 2002 movie Ballistic Eeks vs. Seaver. What? There's 115 reviews and, and they're all X. negative. For at one point, I was like, I was actually ready to say Jack and Jill. Uh, Jack and Jill's not even zero percent. No. A master of disguise is like one percent, and that has like thirty-two percent on the audience. Score. Yeah. It, it's it's interesting how you think of a bad film as gonna be zero percent, but it's not. Um. So. Yeah. Like, where's where's where did the dead go to die on this? <laughs> it's it's a, it, it's, a, it's a indi- uh, it's an independent it's... film. I don't think a lot of independent films are on. No, there are there are some, but it depends on the popularity. Yeah, I don't think we're the. <laughs> It's not that bad of a movie. Like, where Where'd the dead go? That was not a bad movie. Mike. Yes, it is. Mike, Mike. you broke your back scratcher. But, we were but there. afterwards, I accepted the movie after talking with the creator of the movie himself. It doesn't replace it being a it's... bad movie. <laughs> <laughs> look, look, it's oh, yeah, there. It's like, it's but there's there. no critic. Thirteen percent want to see it. Want to see it. Want to see it. Thirteen percent want to see it. <laughs> would you watch it again, Mike? I probably would. Uh, spare me. <laughs> yeah, spare me too, honestly. Wait, wait. Spare me or spare me? Spare. Spare. Good. I'll... Either or. With the Blackbird's flies coming out soon, so I can't wait to see either that. Either or. Either or. Labby's going to do it to you. Uh, either spare you or spare you. Yeah. I'll look uh, so let me find. Because for our discussion of these movies, we're actually going to either defend the movie or go with, with the critics. So our, our so the question is to you guys is, is are your films... Or are you going to defend it, or are you going to go against it? Uh, I'm kind of um, neutral with mine. It's sort of a half defense, yeah. half yeah, it's bad, but I'm, there's worse. I might, yeah, honestly, with mine, I might defend it, but uh, I don't know. I'm going to be more, uh, like Morgan, I'm going to be neutral. Yeah. I'll, I'll explain. Yeah, we'll more. get into that. I will defend only on the. I will probably defend only on the, on the grounds that, that yes, it's bad, but there is worse. Because, but that doesn't necessarily. That doesn't necessarily mean it's worth it. Nutcracker in 3D. <laughs> oh, I. We could have chosen that one, but I don't if think you got, I'm surprised you didn't. Is it even at zero percent? Okay. Yeah. I was just checking. Well, let just checking. Just briefly, I mean, Morgan and I, Morgan and I did let's a watch. did a a let's watch of that a couple years ago, and I remember sitting down and watching that for the first time and recording it and said that, and actually saying afterward, ah, you know, out of all the Nutcracker adaptations I've seen thus far, at least this one has the most effort put into it, and uh, and. Um, that if I put it at first in the so bad it's good category, and my in my memory banks, and then when I actually sat down and edited that, let's watch. I it started getting to me. I'm just like, no. Yeah, what 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 was the motivation behind that? <laughs> I wish I knew. All I know is that the director wanted to do it for like 12 years or so. I guess he had visions of sugar plums and Nazi rats burning <laughs> toys to block out the sun. And Nathan Lane as Uncle mm-hmm. Albert Einstein and Napoleon <laughs> Nutcracker. No, no. Oh, you laugh. Oh, you laugh. Wait, you see John Turturro as a rat. That will give you night terrors. I'm sorry. <laughs> we, I, I was had really legitimate to do it reaction for there. Nathan Lane, but yeah, I don't know. <laughs> You know, everything is not relative. Oh! That's like the biggest joke. That's 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 the payoff at the end. You know, he breaks the fourth wall once in a while. So, also, uh, another key thing you may use in your discussion is actually quoting the uh, reviews from the website. So, for example, 
that our first film has a couple of reviews saying, <clears throat> Scott Weinberg from eFilmCritic.com, you wouldn't expect high art from a title like this, but hoo boy, what a stinker. Okay, the pub works pretty good. Or, geez, that stench is unbearable by Chris Morris of Movie Hole. And that film from these reviews is The Garbage Pail Movie from 1987. Morgan, take it away. Start off the shit fest. It's funny you should say that because, good God, this movie is... Where do I even begin? I mean, why? Just, just why? Why does this exist? I wish I knew exactly why, but no. No, you people are fools. You're all fools. Oh. Really? What? How, how could Spirit Away get in a cameo war? That film is just pure nightmare fuel. I... I guess I guess people 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 are in love with you, Baba. Didn't like it. Didn't like it. Morgan, what what are you doing, Morgan? It, it was weirdness on top of weirdness on top of weirdness. Uh, okay, okay, let me just focus here. Seriously, <laughs> Morgan, you're entering into a world of butter. <laughs> Sorry, Andy. I think he's used to it by this point. I don't think it's a bad movie. I just don't like it. There's some things I disagree. Um, no, I'm actually talking about Garbage Pill Kids, the movie, and this is funny because I remember going through a um, FYE once and seeing it on a DVD shelf, and I thought, oh, this is actually kind of interesting. It could be good. It's only $5, but you know what? Next time. Just, just next time. Then I saw Doug Walker's review of it as a nostalgia critic, and my curiosity began to peak, because I couldn't believe these things existed in the movie. And sure enough, I bought it once when I was dating Megan, and this is a very funny story, I always have it on the DVD shelf, and I actually had like some of the cards in there, like Wendy Winston, Grim Jim, and all the others, and I just had it there to annoy her. And every time she saw it on the shelf, she'd go, <laughs> just exactly. That's exactly what she would do. She'd just take one good look and freak out at it. And then she broke up with me in the novelty of having it around war off, so I sold the DVD. Did you even watch it? Yeah, I did. Twice. So, and then you know what? And you know what? I didn't get brain damage from it because you know why? And I'll tell you exactly why. This movie, th this exact movie, I'll, I'll tell you right now, the biggest problem, judging from how it's written, how it's delivered, it was meant to be animated. That is true. Cards on the table, it was meant to be animated. James, let me say my theory. Seriously, the elements of the cartoon are there. You have the painting's eyes moving like it's something out of a Saturday morning cartoon. You have lame titles for things like Toughest Bar in the World or State Home for the Ugly. These are like things taken from a crazy Saturday morning cartoon. Like well, well, My Pet Monster, for example. Can I also add in the factor that like they even included a lot of the cliches in the... Um... Like a lot, a lot of the cliches you would normally find in an animated film, like including the fact that the main kid, um, he's born with no parents, which is often common. You would find like they lost their mom or like they don't have any parents at all. I saw the movie. born with no parents. How do you how do you do that? You just sort of asexually produce yourself into the world. Maybe he maybe he does budding like SpongeBob. <laughs> that or evolution. A really fast evolution. But no, I, I saw this with Mike and James. They briefly um, use exposition to say he has school or something, and he does have parents, but not written or yeah. something. I don't know. Um, but the thing I also want to point out, too, is that a lot of people say the romance is creepy in a pedophilish kind of way. Here's the yeah, funny yeah, thing. Yeah, I looked this up. I looked this up. I looked yes. this up. I confirmed this for everybody. They were of consent, and there is a line in the movie. Where Tangerine said, come on, he's only like 14 or something like that. And Tangerine is 15. So it's a year apart. They're in the same age group, so 
There's no... But still, even with the age difference, it's a really awkward It is, romance. it's very awkward. It is a really, really awkward romance. I mean, yeah, even though it's comfy, the way they develop it is kind of weird. Like, Tangerine is all like, oh, I have this crow's line and everything and stuff. Oh, you're making me these clothes, that's great. Do you love me? Uh, yeah, sure, just give me, like, ten more dollars worth of that shit and we'll sell it fine. So, okay, mm -hmm. that's down the toilet. <laughs> um... I feel bad. Um, I know the actor they got to play, Captain Manzini, he was in the 1967 Dr. Doolittle musical. Oh, Anthony hmm. Lee? Yes, thank you. Yeah, my friend the doctor said the bulls made, you mm -hmm. know, that kind of thing. Um, and this was the last movie, which is a shame, and he tries. He really tries. I guess he has all these magic powers and the antique shop and everything, which is kind of cool, I guess. That could be something. They don't explain the garbage pill kids that well. Their origins, okay, fine, but there they're is... aliens. No, I guess. No, 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 no. There is another point as to why they decided to make this a live-action cartoon. Because you know what else existed and was popular at the time? Gremlins. Hmm. Gremlins, of course. This movie is cloning. Gremlins, the antique shop, the they never explain Gizmo's origins. Like uh, the the like pretty much the mischief, overly rounded characters. Yes. Like each with their own different yes. personality. There, there's a scene where they go to the movie theater. There's a scene where they go to a bar. Both movies have that, and the fact that they're the garbage pill kids want to create mischief and stuff. The gremlins want to destroy and create mischief and be funny at the same time. Um, I think this was the case where they said, okay, the cards are popular. What can we do with the cards? Hmm, let's see what's going on at the rental charts. Ooh, gremlins. People love gremlins. They're going crazy about gremlins. Okay. So should we make a gremlins cards? No. We make a movie like the Gremlins. We make a, what? And ironically, there were Gremlins uh, trading cards, but they were done for like the film. <laughs> but no, that's sort of the main problem with this movie. It's it's not very original. I mean, in a so bad it's good aspect, it half works, but only if you're really curious enough. I'd say the only way to watch this is with friends and with loads of beer. So you can sit back and be like, wow, I can't believe this exists! Ha ha! But then the subconscious of your brain is like, wow, this exists. It's a film that's so amazingly bad, you sort of wonder how they crafted it. And <laughs> they tried. They, they really tried. There's kind of sort of some things I do admire about it. Like the fact that it's sort of like demented and crazy, and the fact that people greenlit this thing, and they're trying to make something out of it, and it's so bizarre. There's, like, certain shots here and there that I find myself laughing out of unintentional hilarity. Like the scene where they're stealing from the sweatshop, there's a shot where the camera pans downward from the sign of the sweatshop to the blinds of the window, and you see the alligator's eyes just moving around like a googly-eyed cookie monster. Yeah. <laughs> Somehow that cracks me up, I don't know why. But... It, it, it's it's really weird. Like, some of the stuff doesn't make sense. Stay home for the ugly. Mm -hmm. Too fat, too short, too bald. Oh, yeah, and then they had they had people like Santa, God. Uh, Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> they even have a little person. Yeah, there's like short, tall, and they go by descriptions like hairy, fat, or whatever. It was just... And then the gay guard pill kids were like ugly or something. Too ugly. Yeah, mm -hmm. and then the fact that th there's not even there was really not even that much of a plot. Again, they're just so loose with it. Like I guess the garbage pill kids are trying to search for their friends, and they think they're in the state home for the ugly. And then in a supposed reveal, it's like Captain Mean Zini, what about the other garbage pill kids? Oh no, we were too late for them. They threw them into a dumpster and crushed them. That's exactly what they ambiguously do. You see this dump truck parking onto the side and driving off so you kind of assume that there were other garbage pill kids that were not revealed in the film yeah because yeah, they're, they're in a garbage pill and then of course yeah. the, the garbage man 
confuse it for garbage and they get crushed. Oops. And by the way, what's up with the ghetto personalities of these characters? There's that bit where Minzini is begging to go back in the pail and Elliot is like, no way, that pail is jail. He's like jailing Rollo from Cleveland Show. Yeah, because, Al- because yeah. Alligator's supposed to be this, you know, this hip, you know, gangster kind of hip ghetto guy, and you know. You know. Yeah, and yet, and yet he eats like He's got, toes, he's, he's got a, eyeballs he's and got a fingers. foot fetish. <laughs> the Adams family did better jokes. He's like, this I watch, uh, ooh, yummy dog. Nom, 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 nom. <laughs> hey, this guy's got guts. Drinks for everybody. <laughs> yes. Actually, one of the big curiosities for this movie was. Um, Essie Tessie. Uh, and. Uh, okay, I will address that. Uh, uh, we, um, uh, Morgan and I have sort of a running j- joke every time, every time, uh, we watch, uh, uh, a movie together and there's electricity involved in a scene, uh, we quote the song Electric Slide, which says, and I quote, it's electric boogie woogie. But, but, but in this scene, in this film, we have a character who picks her nose, drags her snot out, and tries to use that to fix a TV set, and it fries. And I say, it's electric boogie-woogie. I was like, wait a minute. This is the way too perfect, because she just electrocuted her boogie-woogie. This is it. This is it. I I am so reviewing this movie next season. I was clouded so hard when I heard that. I was like, what? Uh, we have found we have found the golden cup of of uh, the, of nasty here. The moon was alive with Jupiter. <laughs> oh my god! But, but what I was gonna say was, um, what's the who's the character that pisses his pants all the time? I'm oh. Nat Nerd. Yeah, Nat Nerd. Nat Nerd. Yeah, that, that looks like he's. Looks like he's dressed in Superman PJs or something. Yeah, and like Greaser Greg is a greaser, and he has a switchblade. He doesn't even use yes. the switchblade, which is weird. He doesn't even use it. He just, you know, we'll carve out an IOU, and it's like, okay, if you're gonna get something, and you have like a weapon, use. Well, I guess they're not gonna use it. Okay, whatever. There's even this really okay. weird scene where they he supposedly tries to play doctor with one of them, and it fails. Yeah, he's trying or to do like a pickup, like kind of thing. It's a pickup line. So he's trying to hit on one of the girls. Yeah, that, that didn't work so well. Mm-hmm. But like, <laughs> so what I was gonna say about n- Nat that Nerd, happened. yes, this there's this terrible, terrible mm-hmm. running gag with him where his his big thing is that he goes pee and thinks it's funny, and nobody else thinks it's funny, not even the audience. But I'm actually quite baffled at one at one particular part. He's they have one scene where they're all sitting at a table and pay, playing cards and what or uh-huh. something like that, doing something around a table, and he's peeing his pants on the chair. And I'm and I'm looking at this angle, and in order to in order to get this shot, they have to I guess run a hose between the actor's legs or something, and it's uh it it's between the knees but it's definitely below the seat area where it's where it's jutting out so that you have to you have to so the camera can see it and communicate the idea that this guy is peeing his pants and I'm just thinking but wait it's such a steady flow and uh, and it's coming out from underneath the chair where is his penis located <laughs> exactly There's, Although, a re- there's a reason the voice actor's name is Jim Cummings. <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, ah, ah. I did you? <laughs> By the way, guys, I need to ask you something. Considering the like the really bad running gag, which would you prefer, Nat Nerd or Toofy? Toofy. Toofy. Who's, who's, who's Toofy? You don't remember Toofy? 
Goofy, Toofy, pick up your pants. Oh, from Oogie Love. Oh. <laughs> it's an Oogie Loves thing, Morgan. Don't worry about no, it. No, it's it's coming back to me. <laughs> it, it's coming back to me, and it's horrible. So which one do you prefer? Goofy, Toofy. Yes. Uh, oh, he's dropped his sorry, turn. underwear. Un- I, I hate underwear jokes. They're, they're like the Would lowest... You? It goes below scraping the bottom. Worse than girl. piss jokes? Yeah, that would be the hey, pun. Morgan. Uh oh. No. No. Bad James. Bad James. Corner. Oh. <laughs> I'm thankful you didn't wear that a diaper. That was low. I am so thankful you didn't wear a diaper. But no. Yes, I get it. The film is bad. It's it's not even good. But in an entertaining sense, just by how it all comes together and it's so weird and bizarre, that's where I get more of my kicks out of it. To compare... You know, probably you've heard about this title earlier. Um, the film that really gets my good a lot is Nutcracker in 3D, and that's because I love Christmas. I love the Nutcracker. I love the Tchaikovsky score. There is yet to be a good adaptation, with a few exceptions, like Nutcracker Fantasy. And, well, if I was to quote Robert Ebert on this one, thank you very much. From what dark night of the soul emerged the wretched idea for the Nutcracker in 3D? He went on to claim it was also one of those rare holiday movies that may send children screaming under their seats. And by the way, this got a 0% from the critics on Rotten Tomatoes and a 28% from the audience. The same. This is the same statistic uh, of Garbage yep. Pail Kids. Wait, how many, how, many review, how many reviews are there? For Nutcracker in 3D, 30. For Garbage Pail Kids, okay, 11. 11. Okay, I was wondering, it's like, is it the exact same? But it's still <laughs> barely. barely. Yeah, you know, the percentages are the same. So, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going with disgusting, creepy, robotic kids, because at least the way it's so... It's such an interesting mess to watch. Nutcracker in 3D is trying so hard to be like this really family, Christmassy, epic thing, and it backfires. It really backfires. There's a lot of strange stuff that doesn't add up. There's a lot of bizarre artistic choices. Napoleon, there's a, the Nutcracker is a creepy Napoleon. Uh, there's all this really bizarre CG imagery, which is not fun to look at. Like this digitalized chimp at one point has like this really weird pedo smile with all his fangs sticking out. And they say Garbage Kids is mean-spirited? I'm sorry! Nutcracker in 3D? That is a scene where a bunch of rat soldiers tear off the head of a Jamaican kid and toss around like a volleyball and has this goofy music set to it. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry. I'm going with gross kids. At least they try to make something fun out of it and it doesn't work, but at least I can laugh at it because of how it fails. Nutcracker in 3D? It fails. So it, it doesn't exactly deserve a 0% rating. Yeah. No, I think it deserves 5%. Okay. You know, I just want to add one really interesting thing about the Garbage Pail Kids is that, uh, I don't know about you or, or if this would actually be the case, but personally, I feel like the only reason like why the Garbage Pail Kids is ever uh, relevant, there's this one factor that I feel like nobody would ever talk about it. It would disappear into obscurity if it were for the Nostalgia Critic. I feel like right now that, there is a bit of relevance. Be like, mm. because, because like mm. I feel like the only reason why people know Garbage Pail Kids is because the Nostalgia Critic would deem it as the worst movie ever made. Well, and the it, trading cards are huge. Right, that popular. too. In fact, well, those, those are the trading. Well, yeah, those are the trading cards. But I'm talking about the movie itself. Like one of the biggest reasons for it, and like. You know, it kind of is true because, like, sometimes, like, hate can often revive a movie or really make a movie really popular. Like, that, I've seen many cases for it. And, like, there are even some cases where I feel like there are movies that I reviewed and I feel like the movies that I hate, like, the fact that I would hate them are more popular than the movies themselves or even as popular. Like, so um, that, that's kind of the thing, is that, 
like because of the connection with how people say that they hate it, it's the worst movie they've ever seen. Like that's why I feel like like we know a bit about Garbage Pail Kids. That's how like it kind of got revived and like how there's some relevancy and also the factor that it's getting a remake. Thanks Eisner. That's, um that got canceled. Not anymore. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, oh. that got That's canceled. how the one. That's how that's how you know about it, Matt. Yeah. But before before the uh, uh, folks like the Nostalgia Critic were looking at it, folks in, folks in my generation, um, I, I was coming across this, this movie on IRC channels uh, where they, uh, back in the day when those were popular enough to, to use to pirate old TV uh, shows and, and uh, movies. Gotcha. So this, uh, so that was, yeah, that was uh, a, a popular one there, and yeah, I don't know necessarily about anyone uh, reviewing it, but it was it was something that was still talked about. So the the fact that you no know, uh, Doug Walker talked about it, it. People were already doing that right, before. Right, but we're talking about like this generation in general, not talking about the previous generations. Like I'm actually reading the user reviews as we were talking, and I'm th- like two or three of them, maybe even five of them mentioned the Nostalgia Critic in their review. Like, go check out the Nostalgia yeah. Critic review of it. Enough said. I was like, okay, they they re- recommend or something like that. I was like, so. And besides, if I may, for those who aren't baffled yet. Recently, the Shout Factory mentioned at Comic-Con some interesting releases. Take a good look at some of them. You might recognize a few. Wait. If you don't know the movie... If you hey. don't know the movie poster, the movie... There it yeah, is. The, oh, there, there it is. is, yes. It's getting the Blu-ray release. So you get to see it in glorious HD. Yes. It gets better. It's not just a Blu-ray release... It's a collector's edition. Yes, collector's edition, because movie collectors out there want it in their collection. There are only two reasons I'm going to get that movie. If there's some good enough documentaries and deleted scenes. On on, on the bright side of things, we are still getting a Blu-ray release of The Car, Nightmares, and Death Becomes Her. Oh, yes, and also uh, Return of the Living Dead. Oh, yes, there's other Blu-ray releases, but, yeah. So look on the bright side. Just because we're getting a movie that nearly everyone universally hates, we're also getting some cool shit as well. So, so The Bishop of Battle in Glorious HD. I am so buying that one, too. Z- uh, oh, j- 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 just to see the coach of the Mighty Ducks <laughs> against a video game. Or yes. Gonna, like, when you're gonna buy a Garbage Pail Kids movie on Blu-ray, will it also include a code where you can go on iTunes and you can download for free the song? Like, we can't uh, sad, sadly, sadly, Shout Factory doesn't do that kind of stuff, but they do free posters if you order it early. Yeah. Huh. So, like, they, they they have like the theatrical poster on one side and a redesigned one specially made for the release. Oh, all right. They 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 they're they're doing the same thing they did with Nightbreed and the new release of like the Tales of the Crypt movies, Bordello Blood and Demonite and Army of Darkness, which is getting three discs, not two, which is great. Nice. Yes. Okay. <laughs> this is just Okay, well we're stocked up this Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> Pleasant screams, kitties. I'm done. This is just hilarious. I'm reading the user reviews, and there's one way in the top, and it's the best one I've read so far. It's by the user Jimmy Carter. The Garbage Pill Kids is without a doubt the number one worst movie ever made in history. It isn't a comedy or a fun movie. I'm not kidding you. My friend owns this. He hates it too. And we used a disc to cut pizza and use it for a bunch of other crap. <laughs> Because this movie is bleep, the the plot is a piece of bleep, 
as the kid stumbles upon a trash can and a bunch of disgusting little puppets who the creators thought were cute, but actually are disgusting little bleep. They make jokes about crap and toilet humor and, and farting. And if you like that crap, may God have mercy on your souls. I mean, come on. One is an alligator, one's a slobbering pigtail girl, and a slick-haired farter. Worst of all, worst of all of them, there's one of them in a superhero outfit with zits on 98% of his face and is a fire... It's a fire... Fire-haired freak, freak. And who is a... Fire-hosed freak. Fire-haired freak who is a four-eyed creepy kid who... Res randomly pisses himself the real actors are terrible also especially the kid actors the puppets are so creepy and they sing songs that will chill your bones this is supposed to be a kids movie i will hate this movie for a, as long as i live it's not funny or cute or cool or smart this is a terrible disgusting worthless movie that i will hate till the day i die Damn. <laughs> Damn. i just love the fact that they use the disc to cut beats on other crap <laughs> Which like pizza? I'm serving up. What's that? Yeah, is that a pizza cutter? Oh no, it's the garbage pail movie. No, 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 Mike, <laughs> no, Mike. It slices, it dices, it makes juniper fries. <laughs> I just love that. I just love that fact. I'm reading them like, oh my god, that's kind of funny. I'm just, I'm just right out there. It's a bad film, but I think it's an interesting mess to watch. Hell, it's so bad. So, so bad, bad it's good. good. Yeah. I, I I wouldn't say it's so bad it's good. It's so bad it's just intriguing. Yeah, it's just it's interesting part of mm. his movie history. You gotta kind of have to yeah, check out for yeah. yourself. Don't don't rely on anybody's opinions or nothing like that. Just watch it on your own. See what happens. If you like it, you like it. You don't, you don't. You know, the more I think about it, we should probably send this video to Doug Walker and see what he <laughs> thinks. Because he's been dying. He's been dying to see someone who has cracked the sanity of Garbage Bill Kids. I would, I would consider... Yeah, yeah. If and, that's the case, I would consider do like an Animat Watches of it then. As long as I'm with you, buddy. There we go, that'd be pretty cool. cool. And, and I quote straight from his mouth, We do conventions every year in this segment about movies that we like but others hate. No one has said Garbage Bill Kids once. Yes, he does it every convention. He does that panel. Oh man, it's something just walking there. I like him, garbage pill kids. Huh? Yeah. When I was a kid, it's, I saw it once, and I thought it was kind of. I'll admit, I I thought one aspect of it, that I thought it was kind of enjoyable was the fact that it was rebellious and rank. But that does not, in the long run, no, a good movie and make. I will mind you that the soundtrack is amazing. I love the soundtrack. It's got good music. The score. The score. The score, yeah, the score right. is great. Because if you count in the soundtrack, you're counting in that god awful. Like, like we can't do it's anything by what we like <laughs> I kind of like it. Seriously, there's a scene where they're in the sewer and they're messing around with the pipes, and all the pipes direct to different things like uh, sewage, hot tub. There's a pipe that says hot yeah. tub, and they send the sewage into the yeah. hot tub of the bad greaser, biker, whatever's. Yeah. Wow, this movie is a living cartoon. It is. It's history. It, it's, it's, it's a gross-out cartoon, and if it was animated, I'd like to see Ralph Bakshi do it. Ooh. That, that would have been perfect for him. Bakshi might have been able to do it justice, at yeah, the very least. Would, because, because at least he is able to do that kind of stuff. He did Mighty Mouse at the time. Uh... Oh, God, could you imagine a John K. production? Of of uh, garbage pail kids. We got that. It's called Ren and Stimpy. Oh. Yeah. Adult party cartoon. <laughs> I hate the adult oh. party cartoon. There was one. You're episode the pitcher. I'm the catcher. There's one episode I don't mind, but I I seriously, I rather watch garbage pail kids over that. Because the, the gross-out is so through the roof, I need a barf bag. And ironically, there was a Saturday morning cartoon yeah, of the garbage-filled kids. Why it didn't air over here? Oh, we the parents of America say it's too violent for kids. Okay, we'll just ship it over to the UK. It's on DVD, mm -hmm. though. So instead, what we or got next? So so what we got instead was an extra half hour of Muppet Babies. Ninety minutes of Muppet Babies. That's insane. <laughs> 
And that was a popular show. Yeah. I know. Yeah. But, I mean, an hour, okay. 90 minutes. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I just went to heaven. <laughs> so. It's like, it's like 90 minutes of Teen Titans Go, which is what they do now, you know? Eh, yeah. that, that show's okay. Hmm. I would like to see it just to see like what's with all the hate. Yeah, it's just a, if it piques your curiosity, check it out. I don't think Teen Titans Go is a bad thing. It's it's just, it's just yeah, um, garbage pill kids. If you're that curious, God all bless the power you. to you. It it's bad, but it it could have been worse. Oh, it could have been a lot worse. It, it could have been a hell of a lot worse. Oh yeah. So I just I was looking I was looking through the list. I watched a couple and I was like, okay, what movie should I do? There was a movie from 1987, the same year as Garbage Pill Kids, called um, The All Nighters, which, uh, funny enough, stars Suzanne Huff, who you may know as the lead singer of the Bangles, and the director was her mother. So I watched. Norman. So I watched that movie. I was like, okay, this could be a contender. Okay, it could be a contender. It was just this goofy, like, pre-The Hangover kind of 80s comedy kind of thing where uh, Suzanne Hoff played this college kid. They're graduating. They're, oh, they have this big party at night, and it's like, got to be an all-nighter. Hilarity ensues, all that shit. And there's a couple of guys, like, t- surfer dudes, like, hey, man, what's up, dude? Surf's up, man. And I was like, okay, that's going to be something. But I was like, you know what? I saw Highlander 2, The Quickening, on the list. And I was like... God damn it, I gotta talk about this film. Because I love the Highlander franchise. And I have not seen it. Mm-hmm. I have not I have not seen it. I skipped over it to watch Highlander 3 instead. Did, is it, did was it the theatrical it, cut or the It was the renegade cut because it was the I renegade know... version. Okay. I noticed it right away because mm. everything was different from the theatrical. I kinda watched Spoonie's review of it too, kinda refresh my memory. Me too. Yeah, yeah Me I was, too. I was kinda, kinda comparing both versions. I was like Oh, I, got, I watched the Renegade version, which does improve it a little bit, but it's it's a useless sequel. It's, it's, because, uh, all right, if you read the production and trivia on this film, oh my god, oh my god, this thing, this production of this film, holy crap, had a lot of issues. Like, the director was so pissed off because the producers changed the movie way too much, and the only way that the director's cut, the Renegade cut, was able to come out was the the UK the UK was going to distribute it on DVD and they're like hey here you go here's your chance to fix the movie if you want to um the the actors the actors did not like the script at all um um Michael Ironside who plays um Katana he hated the script and he was like you know what we're all here for the money fuck it I'm just going to play it over the top villain just go with the flow and it show it shows mm-hmm. the script is so horrible. Even even Mr. Burns did there with the whole blocking out the sun thing for more energy. It's yeah, actually they, in, well, you know or my the neck cracker in three D even oh, blocking out the sun. No. My, no, the logic of that one doesn't make any sense. We're gonna burn all the toys so we can block out the sun. What? You know, Mike, while you were talking I just found like Roger, like Roger Ebert's like a uh, little caption of what he yep, said in yep. his review, and I just found this so hilarious. He said, "Highlander 2: The Quickening is the most hilariously incomprehensive movie I've seen in many a long day. A movie almost awesome in its yes. badness." He even declared it the worst of 1991. Three, I think. Ninety-one. No, nine ninety one, because that 91. was the same year Nothing But Trouble yep. came out, and he hated that yep. one too. Infamously, he was attending a screen of some kids in the front row, and they were cracking noises. And in the midway of the movie, he walked down and say, he walked down to, to those kids, and he said, "Hey, you don't mind speaking up louder so I don't hear the movie." <laughs> <laughs> True story. He admitted it on the That's show good. too. So okay, um, what do you expect? It's look who's talking. Okay, in the, the, in the theatrical cut of Highlander 2 of the Quickening, they retcon this whole thing. It's supposed to be like a prequel to the first movie, apparently, where 
Apparently, uh, Connor McCloud and Ramirez are aliens from planet Zeist, and they come to planet Earth to save the Earth. Uh, it's not a retcon, that's a full retard. That's what I meant to say. I, My mind's so boggled with this movie, it's unbelievable. Ah. Uh, ah. Uh, planet Zeist. Aliens! Aliens! Out of all things you can write! Uh. I'm gonna write the, the sequel to Highlander, doi, uh, uh, let's see, uh, Connor McCloud is a immortal, but is he from Earth? Mmm, uh, let's choose the planet Zeiss, that'll be working. Sean Connery's character, uh, Ramirez, mm. I can help you with the script. <laughs> the answer of Highlander, aliens. That's real realistic. Click. On the next episode of Ancient Aliens. <laughs> It's, it's just like this, 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 the screenwriter, ah, uh, the, the, the writer of the script. Oh, fuck, who the fuck was that bastard? I swear. Who wrote the script? Yeah, who? Uh, they say that it's written by Gregory Hidden, Peter Bellwood, and Brian Clemens. Yeah, William N. Panzer. Took that many fucking writers to write this shit. <laughs> okay, okay. Mm. Also, also, the sets. Have been compared to those of Blade Runner because it was filmed in Argentina. They went to South America, and oh boy, the story's down there. <laughs> all that, all that's missing is Harrison Ford in the background just eating ramen noodles at a stand. So, There's two writers. A, Give me Blade Runner. The story Runner is too. by two people. The screenplay oh. play was by Peter oh, Bell, Bellwood. Uh, oh man. Man, I, I could read the truth from IMDb so bad, because there were so many interesting tidbits from the movie. Um, but so, in the Renegade version I saw, they the openings they played different from the first uh, theatrical cut. They say that there was this disease caused by the sun, or something like that, or some reaction that people are not liking from the sun. So, Connor McCloud and a bunch of scientists... Uh, uh, invent or create this uh, shield that goes around the whole planet and there's no sun, it's complete darkness, it's all in... so it's in 2024, so check that out. Go and see if we can get, get a shield in the future, that's for sure. Um, yeah, in the near future. In the future. near future, yeah. Uh, we got about uh, nine yeah, years so, left. So let's see, see how the global... It was like the ozone layers or something. It was some environmental thing. It was just so stupid. It's like, wait, wait. Connor McCloud, the immortal, was like, hmm, my girlfriend has this. What should I do? Oh, I got it. I got an idea. Let's make a shield to cover the whole world. Mm -hmm. it's, it's all hug under the giant red it's, dome. It's, why? Why? Why is Connor involved in this? He's, he's a Highlander, immortal. He, he's... He has no attributes to science. He's like, how did... Because, because at the end of the first movie, his uh, uh, his gift that he was given was to be given all the knowledge of the world. Right. So I guess this is what he, he used it but, for, but it's kind of... But at the same pro thing, I, I think you're missing the root of the problem. Root. The root of the problem is... This is Highlander we're yes. talking about. It's supposed to be a fantasy film. The, the problem is the fact that this is a this is a fact the the problem is this is a fact that um, this is a film series that that started out just on a on a pitch, and as they went along, they just said anything goes. I mean, I believe we've talked about these movies before on the uh... on this channel. Well, from one movie to another, they just destroy and liquidate continuity. Well, that's the thing. So... It's, it's just that after this film, the rest of the films and the TV series just completely ignore this film altogether. So they're and then they ignored each the film that came before that and the film that came before that. This is, uh, <laughs> yeah, this is they they can they come up with good ideas to toss into the mix here, but as soon as they come up with good ideas, they take them out in the next movie. Did did they change the nature of the prize in the second film? Or is it still the whole... It, it, yes, it's the same thing. thing. It's the same thing. Because here's the uh, thing. Here's a kicker. Because you've... The, the Renegade version, oh my god, it starts off 
you know, with the text. And, of course, it gets this pan from, you know, the statue they have. And it's like the shield kind of thing. And it pans over to opera. There's there's opera in 2024. Really? Opera in 2024. Yeah. So they, we see an opera. Uh, you still have the Sydney Opera. Oh, the, come on. Yeah. Even Venia has opera. There was a, the latest the Mission Impossible sequel. That has an opera fight I, scene I, staged I'm talking about, it. like, in the future. Like, in the far future. Like, I'm uh, not talking about now. I'm talking about in futuristic world of so opera. Um, so we should go... 2024. Or I bet we'll still have We opera. will. I'm just... 25, 25, there'll be Shakespeare and opera. Yeah, yeah. So, mm-hmm. and then you see Connor McLeod. He's watching the opera, and he's old. He's old. Like, okay, so... Uh, he, from... After he got the prize, he went to being mortal again, and he grow, grows old. Um... <laughs> um... Who wants to live forever? Um... But the thing is, in the Renegade cut, they kind of explain that the... the, Because uh, Ramirez is like, remember, remember. And he remembers a point that in the theatrical cut is when they're on the planet Zeiss. But in the Renegade cut, it's kind of like in the past, where they're trying to say they're freedom fighters from a war in the past. And uh, Ramirez chooses Connor McLeod to be the leader of the uh, freedom fight. And something happens... Didn't happen in a gazillion years, but what the hell? It, something happens, and they get like banished to like planet Earth from these high council people, and these high council people say that Connor McCloud has a choice between being mortal or coming back to the planet or back to the the wherever the fuck they are. So, um, there's a point in the movie where they see the high council again and they're on they have this huge screen where they see Connor McCloud in the future and they're talking to Katana it's like uh, you know we, he still has time to figure out whether he wants to come back or be immortal still that's fine <laughs> it's like putting the renegade cut it's like they how did that what's the technology they're in the past but they have the technology to see the future and travel to the future so how does that <laughs> Okay. How did this all work? It, it doesn't. Again, you're trying to breathe logic into a Highlander film. I know. It's supposed to be. So... What do you mean there, logic? There's, there's logic. <laughs> There's supposed to be logic somehow. Cause come on. I don't know. Well, in the in the first film, you the the time the time span that uh, Ramirez and McLeod spent to spent together was just. Was just what a couple of months probably to uh, to to train him up a little bit, and then and then this movie comes along and says, oh yeah, during that same time, during that same time they were interplanetary uh, aliens or yeah. something. So there's your problem right there. They had to create other Highlanders just to make a sequel. Yes, they want because no, it didn't have to be like that. They could they could have made a sequel where, guess what? It's the it's him dealing with the world after getting the prize and not necessarily having to get another yeah, Highlander. Exactly like that they because the producers wanted to make the film because the, the the film grows so high in the box office like it's a money maker. Ooh, let's make a sequel. Let's push that out four years after the first film, and it's just, um. Uh, so it's, it's, a it's a huge mess it's like but as I was watching it I kind of got the feeling where I was like okay okay there's some good bits and pieces out of here but it's just it's it's just weird like the uh, Kitana played by Michael Ironstein sends these two goons to go kill Connor McCloud in the future uh, in the future and uh, <laughs> they surprisingly get their heads chopped off because they're immortal, and that makes uh, Connor to get the quickening, to get all the power from those two and become immortal again. I was like, oh, oh what, 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 what about those crazy fighting twins? Are like, That's ah, talking about. Oh, yeah, they're crazy. Like, like, oh, and the voice is like, it's like McLeod, McLeod, I'm coming to kill you. It's like deep voice. It was so weird. 
McLeod, come out and play! <laughs> it was like those were the craziest people. Um, oh my god, it's just, it's so, it, it's unnecessary. You should have stayed alone. It should have been Highlander, period. Nothing. They brought back Ramirez from the dead. Like, as, as. Mm -hmm. Oh, explain as, this, please. I don't understand this, because in the first movie, they killed him off. He's dead. Idiot. He's he dead. And Sean Connery, mind you, in Sean Connery's career, this is the second time in a franchise he's played the same role twice, or more. Like, James Bond is the most strong uh, string of films he's appeared in, but this one, oh boy, comes back as Ramirez, and as he's, uh, as Connor gets the quickening, he yells, Ramirez! Ramirez! And that, all of a sudden, poof, brings him back to life, and he's in Scotland. And is in a hilarious scene, this is a hilarious, Actually, the scene where he pops up in Scotland during a Scottish play, um, the Shakespeare play of um, Hamlet. Macbeth. Oh. I think it was Hamlet. It was to be or not to be kind of thing of a skull. It, it's, yeah, it's, it's the scene where Ham, Hamlet's doing the Yorick speech. Yeah, you know, so... The last part yeah, of Yorick. Yeah, because... Uh, I know him well. So, Sean Connery as Ramirez, like, he doesn't realize that the play, so he's actually talking to the person, like, in real like real talk. He's like, oh, there's... Boy, you you have a connection with this young man and this the skull. It's it's a very witty kind of conversation. I couldn't paraphrase it verbatim, but it was hilarious. And he's like the actor saying, "What are you doing here, shithead?" And Sean Connery's like, "Shithead, what a shithead!" <laughs> it's the best line in the movie. Shithead, what is a shithead? A shithead is the person that. That just I did hardly look right. Yeah. <laughs> but uh A shirt hand? What is a shirt hand? I'm just glad I saw but... you get away with the voice. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I I need to warm up for my Connery these days. But um That's very easy. Yeah, they... you just let the voice oh, transfer your teeth. Like like you leave like a little Oh wrong. Oh let me try this out. A shirt hand. What is a shithead that you speak of? Matt, that's Patrick Stewart. No, no, no. What is this head of shit? Does British. it finish hell? Patrick's... No. So, yeah... Uh, but, you're getting me... So that... that <laughs> lot, so the, lore, the line shithead comes <laughs> back again in full circle because he's walking the streets and he's coming by, you know, looking at the... Because he's in the future. It's like he's confused by all the technology so he sees this, this like, display in the electric, electronic store and all the TVs has a camera on him he's, like, looking at the TV and some guy, like, hey, man, nice threads. Like a sarcastic, like, little remark. And he's like, shithead. <laughs> it was so... <laughs> I was like, okay, now he knows what shithead means. It would have been so much funnier if he's, like, down the street and sees a prostitute. He's like, hey, shithead, I'd like to go back to my place. You're not far off from that, Morgan. Because, <laughs> you know, he had... Sean Connery has a lot of... Uh... <laughs> love... Ursula Adams. More love connections down in Argentina. Um... Probably bigger, probably bigger than Kevin Costner in Hawaii. Oh! Ooh. Ooh, what? Mm. But... The Sean Connery up. flirting around on on the production yes. here. Yes. Oh. oh wait, really? wait oh. let me find the trivia here. I think I read. That is not good. Where did I read this? Where'd it go? Uh. Ah, uh, but yeah, James, talk talk about Highlander two for a bit, because I'm trying to think about this as I'm. <laughs> I just want to say I just want to say this before anyone else does. Remember, kids. Fifty no's and a yes means yes. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I do. Yeah, the thing with the the thing with with Connery's involvement in this in this production as uh, as Ramirez, uh, we yes the the play scene is actually quite amusing. I'll, I'll give it that much. But here's. Here's where I just sort of lifted an eyebrow when I was watching this movie. And believe, actually, I watched this movie 
years ago when I was uh, babysitting my neighbors, um, they had the they had a copy on videotape, and uh, Sean Connery comes traveling in by way of a lightning bolt, lands on the stage, yep. and no, this the uh, the actor playing Hamlet doesn't break. He just no, keeps yeah, he going keeps going. It, even though, like, okay, someone just roll. Oh yeah, guy on um, guy in, landed via lightning bolt. That's totally, um, totally normal. You know, show must go on. Nobody, nobody's questioning this. Nobody's questioning this. <laughs> it's so, it's so baffling. Just roll with it, I guess. Yeah, it was just, mm-hmm. it was just funny when he appeared, and then. And then, of course, he goes to, um, it's funny, because Ramirez gets a montage in this where he goes clothes shopping. He gets a new suit. <laughs> he goes to a clothing shop. He's like, I need some new threads. I need a, uh, I need a new suit. I need to visit a friend soon. Uh, this is starting to remind me of, like, they're turning Highlander into just visiting Yes, because that's what Mira's character is like, because he's all confused in the future. He's like, what is going on in this? Like, that, I it's can only the imagine. Fish out of yes, water. Fish out of water story, yes. Come out just like Grillin at the end of the movie, just like, like comes out with jeans and like, like, like listening to his headphones and stuff like that. He gets a nice, really tailored suit, and the owner's like, you know, it takes six weeks to get a suit, and, uh, the Ramirez is like takes his, his like it's like a pearl earring like an antique you know he's worn it for years and he takes it off I want it right now and the guy's like okay and there's a montage that goes through and he gets it like within six hours or less it's like it's so weird so weird um so fucking weird I think I I think I found your source here Mike yeah uh yeah, the uh, according to the IMDb, Sean Connery was sued by an assistant director for sexual. Harassment. Yes, there we go. Thank you. I was looking through the trivia trying to find that. No, no, no. Now wait just a minute. I did not have sex with that woman. I did have sex with that woman. <laughs> yeah, and there's there's record there's written records about the the love of. Affairs of both uh, Christopher Lambert and <laughs> and Sean Connery with several Argentine yes. women. That must have been one awkward three-way. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh man, you could just you could but, just read and read about the production of this. It's unbelievable. They should have made a book out Mike, of it. Well, I guess the, there is Mike, a book in Argentina that somebody wrote. It's it's in it's it's weird. I somewhere. I mean, the movie is promoted like the biggest super production filmed in produ- in Argentina, so it's the biggest thing in Argentina. Mike, when you uh, when you watched the Renegade cut, did it? Could you tell where the scenes were spliced in? Uh yeah. I, I mean, I I haven't seen the theatrical cut of of the film, and while watching this thing on videotape, I could tell. I could tell, because, you know, because... It, it it looked kind of like um, it it looked kind of like they they didn't even master this stuff before they before they inserted it in there. They just sort of used Cause... freaking dailies Cause... or something. Because all I remember is that of course they cut the opening scene out, which was supposed to be set in 1999, where Conor McCloud sets up this shield with the scientists, and that's actually like a flashback later on in the film, which I give him points for that. Um, but like the opening is like the opening crawl, you know, text, and then it goes to the opera scene, and then of course when he goes like a flashback to the past or a flashback to Planet Zeiss, you don't know, see the spaceship that they changed the spaceship to like a building or something, which was unique of them to do and. And there was like this scene where I was talking about the uh, the high council checking out the screen, and it was like a like a hologram screen, which is just in the dialogue was just redubbed, I guess. There was there was nothing I noticed that was like edits or anything like that. 
Mm. But I was kind of like... And they must have sipped it up a little it bit better. It must have been, because it was Hulu who had it. So, don't ever watch a movie on Hulu, especially with the damn commercials in between. Um, it's <laughs> Highlander 2, The Quickening. The Quickening, oh, The Quickening. There's only two, three times where he does The Quickening. No, two times, because the, the two... Coon, the goons, and then Katana gets killed off and he gets the quickening. It's just... And there's a subplot where there's a, 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 a renegade renegade team or some kind of group called... Oh, what was it called? The Color. It was a color name. Oh, what the fuck was it? Cobalt. Cobalt. There was a team called Cobalt that was going into the, the S.H.I.E.L.D. Uh, building to, you know hack into it or shut it down because it was because it's causing this post the you know gritty world after there's no sun for 20 god years or so and that went nowhere i mean the female just stayed as a love interest for conor mcleod like it was it was so forced in it was not even worth it it was just like I, I, I hate this. There were some good parts about it, but it's it's it's. Is it is it as painful as the condom eating scene in Highlander Three? <laughs> that was hilarious, Morgan. Are you kidding me? That was fucking hilarious, Morgan. That was hilarious. I love that. Because <laughs> he was so confused. He was like, <laughs> spits it out. Worse. Worst ball gum ever. That was a good scene. No, I meant, was it like that in the sense you ate this movie? It didn't. Holy crap, it's been an hour and 50 minutes. Are you serious? <gasps> We're only halfway there. Holy shit. Are you serious? Are you fucking serious? <laughs> oh my god. I'm... Mike, this is your I'm... fault. Were you not. Were you not. Thinking, were you not looking at the the timer, Mike? Oh, no, no. I'm so. Okay. okay. Hey, we need Mike. to start moving forward with this then. Yeah, really. Oh, how right. to? So, Mike, do you agree with how... I? Do you agree with Rotten Tomatoes rating? Shut up, let me. Highlander two of the quickening. Uh, based on the reviews on the Rotten Tomatoes. It does deserve it at a point, but it's like a guilty pleasure for me. Because the Renegade mm -hmm. cut did improve it way better than the theatrical cut, based on Spoonie's review. Uh, he did. Based on what I saw from his review. And the action scenes were pretty good in it. Uh, there was a couple of funny scenes, and I'm just going to hide under the table as I seek low in sorrow. Uh, Highlander 2, if you're a fan of the first Highlander, you can just skip it and go straight to Highlander 3, the Sorcerer or the Final Dimension, whatever it's fucking called, because that's a great sequel to the first Highlander. <sighs> Let's talk about 1997's Kiss Casper, A Spirited Beginning, which is a prequel to the 1995 Casper film. It gets no respect, no respect at all. Okay. Oh my god. I shall, uh, I, I shall introduce this one. Um, yeah. Uh, 1995, a, a little reboot happened with the Casper franchise, which I was there and I was, I was enjoying it along with the other kids is my age and thinking, okay, this is, uh, this is a this is a fun movie. What are they gonna do next? And uh, I think, <laughs> and then uh, here comes along a movie that uh, I really wish our our um, proposed co uh, guest host for this episode, Brandon Nichols, aka the Hardcore Kid, would have been here for because he reviewed it. And thanks to his review, I did not have to rewatch it for this. Um, so, a according to what I read up on, 
1995 Casper film was successful, and there were there were plans uh, to make a sequel, but instead those instead those plans got turned into a Saturday morning cartoon called The Spooktacular New Adventures of Casper. Not gonna lie, I loved those as a kid. It was okay. They were really hit and miss uh, for me because it was it, it I I saw what I know they had the same writers as the as um, as the film and all that, but um, it it felt like it was it was trying it was trying to be more animaniacs in its style of humor, which is ironic considering Sherry Stoner wrote it. And so, so, what do you do when a when a movie is successful enough? Bank on it. More, more, more. Just, more. just like fucking Highlander. Oh, it's pop. It's no, 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 no. It's, you it's re- popular enough. You. More, more. The correct. More. <laughs> the correct answer is. The correct answer is, you reboot it. Isn't that right, Amazing Spider-Man, Fantastic Four? <laughs> you reboot the franchise the next frickin' chance you get. Uh, not always. And that's what I'm going to say, is that this Casper Spirited Beginning was billed as, as a prequel. Yeah, it was. But, but I will... Hence and so forth, refer to as it as a reboot because uh, when it came out, it said, "Okay, this is a prequel leading up to the film before," and here's here's what the '95 Casper film did. It established that Casper used to be belong to a family that passed away back in the 1940s. And uh, live in a place called Whipstaff Manor. Really? I thought he was this... Charlie Brown. Mm. <laughs> God. Hey, yes, he 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 died of cancer. Sure. No, it was syphilis. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so, going into going into this. A spirited beginning, you expect if it's going to be called a prequel, that's the story that you're going to get. And no, it is not the 1940s. It is very, very obviously mid 1990s still. There is nothing about Whipstaff. There's nothing about uh, Casper's family. And the, uh, the three ghosts who we learned in the previous film that were his likably incorrect uncles are now his surrogate uncles. And so I went for a long time after this defending this film as the as the one se- sequel or prequel or what have you in the Casper franchise that, that wasn't quite as bad. And I don't I I really find I really find that that hard to to defend now. <laughs> I really like do. now you're looking back going, what was I? There's Maybe only, I should There's only two good things I remember. The Ben Stein cameo, which is brief, and Ronnie Dangerfield, and that's about it. Yeah, they... Because they were in the last movie, and they had... And they had their fun cameos in there. I'll, I'll give them props I, for this. I'll give them props for this one. It's very rare to hear Ben Stein scream. Mm-hmm. He's actually this fruit person. He's like, oh, welcome to Whipstaff. And he turns around and sees Casper. Ah, ghost! <laughs> actually, the place is... Actually, this place is called Deeds Town, but you're close. Oh, I thought it was Friendship. Oh, yeah, Friendship. Yeah, they, um... Yeah, they... So... I, I'm gonna call this the Deeds Town timeline because... You know they reboot they reboot the thing, and the, the funny thing is, with every Casper special, and every direct-to-video, every other 
another direct video sequel after this. Uh, every TV show spin-off, it was always detailed. It was never leading back to the 95 film. In any way, shape, or form. No friendship, Maine? No. Not even close. They... Uh, I, I should have been... I, I was actually... I actually should have... Uh, have been warned by the front cover of this thing. There was a little, there's a little tiny logo on there that I missed before I checked it out of the movie store as a kid. The Saban logo. Oh. Okay. Here's here's my story with Saban. I I gave I give them a lot of props. For fooling everyone into thinking that Power Rangers was actually an anime, an American show. Uh, their their cutting it, their mastery and and cutting of that was was very was very nicely fooling to everybody. Right. But I never really. Here's a fun fact about me. I never got into Power Rangers. I never got into VR Troopers. I tried to get into Beetleborgs. I tried to get into Superhuman Samurai Cyber Squad oh, and all God. those other shows no. that they were producing that were don't tell me that were just that were just um, knockoffs of the Power Rangers formula. And I realize I realize that's what they that's what they did during this time period. If they were not Trying to recreate the success that they had with Power Rangers, they were getting their hands on other franchises and screwing them up. Mm. But and so I got the impression, and I, I quote this to this day. When I was a kid, I, I said I always said to myself, "Saban is Satan with a B instead of a T." Oh my God! Wow. Oh my god. And when they're and when they're yeah, key point in uh case in point we have this film where as soon as I queued it up and the and the Saban logo came on I shuddered. I shuddered. You were just there like oh no. I'm shuddered. What have I done? I, I shuddered. And... And then I sat down and I watched the rest of the film. And you know what? I gave it... I guess I sort of gave it a pass. But... There's one... They, they couldn't... They couldn't stop themselves from doing this. And this is the one thing that uh, that so very much implements this film time period as being the 90s, is the one point where Casper at one is talking to one of the this token child character in the film, and uh, he goes invisible because he's feeling depressed, and he picks a toy up off the desk and waves it around in the air. And it is a Beetleborg toy. Another Saban property. And they're waving it in your face. I'm just going to go uh, play around with this product placement. Uh, oh, I forgot Steve Goonberg is in this movie. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yep. He, he hit on hard times after Short Circuit. Uh, Steve Gutenberg, uh, Lori Lawton from Full House. They made the movie without me. Polly Shore's in this too, by the way. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh that's who he voiced. He was Kabosh's, like, little minion or whatever, and Kabosh is voiced by James Earl Jones. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And for the for the films after that, he was the only named celebrity that was still willing to sell out. I thought that was because the voice sounded like 
Martin Short than Polly Shore. I find that really weird. What? Like, what? Even what? When I, when I, no, when, no, when no. I, you do not do that, Martin. Wait. No, I'm not even kidding. I am not even <laughs> kidding. Just... When I first when I first saw the movie as a kid, um, well, eons, I was like maybe like 11 or 12 or so. It I it sound the voice sounded very Martin Short, but I knew it wasn't Martin Short. It was Diet Martin Short. So I was like, okay, whoever this voice, whoever this voice actor is, forget it. And then just today, I figure out it's Paulie Shore thanks to this goddamn thing I still have in my collection. Whoa! <laughs> what? You're they reading this in... right. Is that a? Oh. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. I was, as he was talking about Saban, I was looking up Saban, and of course they produced it, but they also did the music for it, so... A soundtrack exists! Yeah, so... It's under... Featuring that one hit song, that, that catchy montage song that the, that plays when Casper and the kid are, are making dinner for his birthday. Delicious by Shampoo. That went somewhere, right? Let's see, we also have... Love yes, Station. that's the one... We also have Love Sensation by 911, Best Friend by CTFG, I'm Not Alone by Ellen Ten Demon, Don't Worry Be Happy by Bobby McFerrin, I Want to Be With You by Backstreet Boys, Spooky Madness by Big Bad Voodoo Daddy, Candy Pop by B.I.S., No One Loves Bear by Oingo Boingo, Big Bomb Bomb by Woody Dawn, You're in Trouble by CTFG, and I question the title of this one. By Supergrass, their song, Man Sized Rooster. <laughs> what? There it is! There it is! Man Sized Rooster. This was a Christmas gift. This was on the rack of a Christmas tree shop of soundtracks and stuff, and I guess it was like $5 or something. Morgan, by the way, um,. Oh, it's kind of like me getting the Tom and Jerry movie every, for Game Gear. Every time I try to get rid of this thing, the, all the stores are like, nope, we can't get this, not on our roster. Great, this is a curse. I am stuck with it. Morgan, um, when you mentioned so I Want to Be Like You by the Backstreet Boys, that's not a cover, is it? I don't know. It, no, no, it's not a cover. It's a different song. Okay, it's a different song. Okay, okay. I was thinking, like... Man Size Rooster is a song by Supergrass, released in 1995 by a British band. Oh my goodness, I'm looking at this. There's a music oh. video, too, by the way. There, there's even so... a... There, there's even a... There's even a rap of Casper the Friendly Ghost in the main song. I forgot about that. Oh yeah, here's the little lackey or whatever to this guy. I actually I actually had this film on VHS as a kid. I kid you it not. Is. I kid you not. I had this film on VHS as a kid. I popped it in. I watched guys, it. Guys, look what I found. This is the ultimate obvious of fail and desperation. Get cool, Casper still. B one of the first one thousand kids to fill this out and send it back. Make sure you ask your parent if it's okay to send this in. Thank you for your response. If your response it's one of the first one thousand you receive, we'll send you a cool Casper gift in four to six weeks. Good luck. Uh, here are the questions I have. What are some of your favorite musical artists? Did you buy Casper and a cassette or C D? Where did you get that? <laughs> Record store, toy store, or gift? This is really sad to read. Who bought this album, you, parent, or other? How many CDs or cassettes did you buy or receive last month? What are your favorite TV shows? What are your favorite magazines? This is a depressing survey. If this is the surveys that I have at my retail job, I'm just going to sit down and cry. <laughs> it's like, wow. Nothing has changed. This is the executive's version of a survey. Still, the hologram is kind of cool if you can see it. You know, oh, yeah. you can, you can, holy crap! That's pretty this cool. Is the hologram. This is the only. Yeah. This is the only good thing about the album. Yeah. It's a hologram. Oh, so I got a question, James. I got a question. Mm -hmm. Is this worse than Casper meets Wendy? 
Oh, oh, oh we're 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 gonna get to the something interesting here. Um, if you know this on Rotten Tomatoes, uh, this film only has six reviews. Look at Casper five, actually, and meets Wendy, huh? Actually, oh, just five. five so. Okay. Whatever it is, Casper and Wendy, Casper meets Wendy has about the same, and it's not at zero percent, because one, 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 uh, the rating. When someone actually had the audacity to come in and give it a, a, a pity, a pity harmless review for Hillary Duff's sake. Yep. Oh my God. One fresh review. Gonna, I was gonna make that joke. I was gonna say, oh, it's probably because they love Hillary Duff. Oh my God, I'm right. I'm psychic. So, the best part about it is that the person who gave it a fresh rating is from Common Sense Media. <laughs> That's what I just found. Yeah, I'm reading it too. She quotes, Hillary Duff's silly spooky face is good tween fun. No, this is... Why? Okay. Common okay. Sense Media, everyone. Can we can oh. refresh my brain? Who is Common Sense Media? I have we, no idea. Common Sense Media, we are, rate, educate, and advocate for sense, kids, apparently. families, and schools. It's apparently... Okay, I have no idea what the site is. It's weird. It's educational, but they can't tell it when the movie's dumb. Okay. <laughs> so... <laughs> I'm looking at the review. And they have categories. What's the story? Is it any good? Families can talk about. Movie details. Okay. In Casper Meets Wendy has the uncle ghost having... Uh, having near creepy affairs with uh with uh Wendy's witch ants. Oh yeah, they possess a bunch of guys and of course fans are why do I forget the fat one? Um the climax has the climax has uh, some grand high witch character guy by Guy Warlock, Hamilton. throwing Sorry. Wendy Sorry. into a zone <laughs> throwing a Oh, the climax is so memorably memorably bad. He throws Wendy into a zone of no existence so that she won't lead to his destruction. But when she flies in there, she's just sort of floating around, not touching anything, waiting to get saved. She's completely in no danger whatsoever. And then it's the uncles who are the heroes because they appear as a ghost and frighten this warlock character. George Hamilton and says the evil who's warlock. Supposed to be, who, who's supposed to be all powerful, but he, he, and not afraid of ghosts or anything like that, but all of a sudden he's afraid of this thing. <laughs> and then when he falls into the zone of no existence, he collides with the sides of it, of the vortex, and disappears. But Wendy's still just sort of waiting there to be rescued. And I'm like, no, 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 this is such an obvious, oh, she, this is an obvious cheap save right here, they have to toss in a rope and, and pull her out, like, no, she was in no danger whatsoever, and that's, and that's why I'm going to defend, that's why I'm going to do something that I begrudgingly would have to do, and that is actually defend a spirited beginning, because after... It was after this point in the series, everything just started to get worse and worse and worse and worse. Well, also, Every time there was a TV special, I had to change the channel because I couldn't sit down and watch it for five minutes. Not but even, I actually not even the Hanna Barbera special where he saves Christmas. And it does a little Not crossover. even that one. But but they have like a little crossover with Yogi and the gang. And there's this. Fred and Ghost is like a big jerk and his heart warms and he sees Casper's message about giving friends a good Christmas. I loved that one as a kid. Was that before or after this? Before 1995, like 70s. Mm. Okay, that doesn't count. I'm talking everything after. Right, seriously, do see it. 
All right. We'll we'll make an appointment this Christmas season, okay? Hey. Um. Yeah, just you and me and Devin. Um, and you but... completely forgot. I, if I remember correctly, I think it's. I think it's like uh, Kathy. Yeah, Kathy Moriarty. This is her second mm. time in a Casper film. Oh. Oh yeah, with uh, oh. Casper meets Wench. With, 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 yeah. with Shelley Duvall and Terry Carr. Okay. okay, I get it. Completely unrecognizable here. It's it's kind of amazing. Oh come on, you can tell it's her because of the voice. She has that. She has that really, you know. Just like a rabbit, croaky, shaggy kind of voice. She, yeah, she's but she's not she... nearly as funny here, so th that's that's what throws it off. Well, I'll put it this way: I didn't know Polly Shore was the mirror person. Oh yeah, and he's credited as a voice actor. Well, he did a goofy movie. He's being movie. filmed. Yeah. Well, so it doesn't make sense either. You actually see him. Yeah, exactly my point. So. The, the final shebang for this whole Deeds Town timeline is in 2005-2006 with uh, Casper's Scare School. A point where they decided well beyond before this that they had to go to CGI. Oh. <laughs> and... Uh, I, this is some... This is a... Uh, an atrocity. I mean, I'm just. I, I watched this on Netflix last year. I tried to watch it on Netflix, but I ended up. I ended up saying, "Okay, you know what? I'm just gonna turn around and sleep." I forced myself to sleep on this one because. In the first five minutes, you see background characters walking through a store, and you know how background characters you look at an, at, a, at an animated film and they look like they're unfinished. Well, that's what these guys are, and they're walking up to the camera, and they got big bulbous heads with big bulbous eyes on either side, and they're going. <laughs> is, is this the CGI animated Christmas movie? No, this is the CGI. This is Casper's Scare School. Oh, they were talking about Casper's Haunted Christmas because I had like a weird blooper reel at the end. Oh uh, yeah. Uh, you no, can tell when for no you can reason. tell when you. First, I'm sorry, but for no reason in the blooper reel, it's all animated, by the way. For no reason, they have like Fatso running in, cross-dressing because hilarity. He doesn't even say a word. It's weird. Mm -hmm. I... This exists. They. They're trying to. They they're trying too hard to make this funny, and it just didn't. Yes. They, there was no way to recapture the charm that they started out with. So, yeah, I'm. Uh, I, I say, DreamWorks, DreamWorks uh, is uh, in charge of the of the franchise now, or at least they own the, the rights. Uh, yeah, they. The they library. Own, they, own the yeah. Yeah, they have the rights now. Yeah. And, and they they branded. Uh, they branded Casper now as their as their Halloween cheermeister or something like that, and I th I think that's that's probably best where to sort of leave things at mm -hmm. uh, for this time being. If they decide to do it, anything with them in the future, um, best of luck. Yeah. Screw these uh, town. I wouldn't, and, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if they would make like a an animated feature with Casper, but I get, like for me, like if they do, we'll see how it goes. Because you never know with DreamWorks. It could either be a major hit or it could just be Shark Tale. I'm still I'm still waiting for that hot stuff movie. Hot stuff? Oh yeah. That one. Yeah, but like at this rate, like wait until like maybe twenty twenty. Yeah, this little hot stuff was a demon character that was supposed to be Casper's antithesis. Oh yes, and he made the cameo in the Simpsons episode. Yes, he was in Super Hell because his comics were that bad. <laughs> so the thing I noticed with Dish Film and the director, 
Sean McNarma, I think I said that right, he directed quite a few films you may or may not know. Uh, after A Spirit of Beginning, he did Three Ninjas, High Noon at Mega Mountain, Casper Meets Wendy, uh, the Even Steens movie, uh, and the cake, the icing on the cake, Bratz, the movie. Oh, dun, dun, dun. And oh. he directed Bratz the movie, and it's got 9% on Rotten Tomatoes, so seven people had fresh reviews for this sucker. Seven people? If, if I may. <clears throat> dun, dun, dun. Seven. Seven fresh reviews out of 70 Rotten reviews. Seven, oh, that's not a freaking moron. I need to see this. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's not at 0%. And he's, he's the same director, too. The flock of sheep is this? <laughs> Wait, how many of the top critics? Two. Two of the top critics. I, oh, I see Jenny Cremone, I for film. Bratz is a surprisingly watchable movie. No, it's not! What are you talking about? It could certainly have... They gave away the whole movie in the trailer. No! You lie! <laughs> I am never reading from I for film. Uh, no, no, this is amazing. This July. is. <laughs> no. He also, let's see, directed the Sweet Life movie after that. Soul Surfer. He directed the Robo Sapien rebooted movie, which is based Wait. on the Robo Sapien mo- toy. Wait, they made a movie out of the Sweet Life of Zach and Cody? Really? Yeah, it was a Disney oh, Channel God. movie. Eh. And. Just when you think his his career is going to get any better at this point, he directs Baby Geniuses and the Treasures of Egypt. Oh, good God. There's another Baby Geniuses movie out there that I didn't know about. Oh, Baby Geniuses in the Space Baby? That, that's coming now, too? Okay. I thought they already made a third one. There's a third one. That's the fourth one, and now the fifth one. Yeah, the third one is John it's... Void returning or something like that. Oh, yes. this is upcoming. Okay, completed on IMDb. Okay, I was looking at Wikipedia. Holy the, crap. The Come plot on. is that a baby is smarter than a dog in space. <laughs> what? Oh my god. Oh my god. Isn't that That's also the, the summary? Oh, sh- So basically, it's Son of the Mask in space. Oh, Sean McNerma. You directed Apparently some... his best movie he's ever made is... Oh, wait, wait, were you talking about that? What? No, it wasn't the movie... Oh, no, 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 this is a different movie. Apparently his best movie is Race space to Space. Space with 67%, yeah. And it, it's it's with a boy... And a chimp. And a monk... And a chimp in a... In, a, in an astronaut suit. <laughs> that's literally kind yeah, of Yeah, that's sad. according to them, though. <laughs> Guys, this is... I can summarize my feelings in just one image. Hmm. <laughs> so yay! It's the return of the news. Yeah, I think this is one of the worst directors ever. This, this man is a is a cluster park of, of bad choices. So, so I just want to bring that up. Okay, you know what? Soul Surfer wasn't so bad. No, it wasn't. It was really I, good. I'll, I'll give that, it that. that, you know, that Soul, Surfer Soul Surfer was good. Was yeah. But I just wanted to mention that since he directed Spirited Beginning <laughs> in his long career. Uh, like, how can you... How can you... It, it, it's sad with the with all this guy's uh, career choices. Uh, he had... Uh, he only has one feel-good movie in there, and that's Soul Surfer. <laughs> I, I am I... not going to trust this director ever again. I did it. I accomplished what other directors have been trying to do years for a living. Yay! So, yes. No. So, does Casper Spirit of Beginning deserve the 0% rating on Rotten Tomatoes, James? No. Casper Meets Wendy deserves the 0% rating. Casper's Christmas, or whatever that Haunted was. Christmas. <laughs> the Haunted one Christmas. With Haunted Christmas, the one with the redneck-ass theme song. Uh, <laughs> Casper Scarecrow. No, no. Those, those all, those all deserve the zero percent rating. With, with Spirited Beginning, 
at at least at, at, at least it wasn't as bad as the rest of it. It could have been a lot worse. It could have been Tales from the Crypt Ritual. Maybe maybe there maybe if I rewatched it and actually sat down I could find that that there are some moments in here that they were actually trying to be charming, but my god no, the CGI even is pretty dead. It's straight to video 1997. This is circa Dragon Heart 2 territory right here. And this is something I should really point out in the animation effects of Spirit Beginning. There were certain shots in this movie that feel like it was made to be in 3D. Like, you see that scene with Stretch yelling at the kid, and it's just the shot of him stretching his head into the camera and just screaming mm -hmm. at him. I always thought that should have been in 3D, and they even do that again, like, near the ending where someone plants a bomb in the house. Yeah, there's a subplot where they try to destroy the house because of the ghosts and stuff, and they get this army guy who's so obsessed and it's worth he decides to plant a bomb in the house. Um, and they if, don't... If you want to... And there's, and, there's, and there's a shot of the ghostly trio hovering above the bomb, and they're trying to find Casper, and Stretch sends out Stinky and Stretch, and then in one shot, his head stretches in front of the camera again like it's supposed to be in 3D. It's like, okay, if this was intended to be in some certain medium, it should have been that way. Like, come on, what's up with the awkwardness there? I get it. He stretches, but you don't need to do that. Mm-hmm. I mean, well, look on the bright side. We did get our, we did our stretchy phrase screaming in 3D. It was John Turturro and frickin' Nutcracker in 3D, and that was scary as hell. <laughs> How did it get back to that one? For, for Christ's <laughs> sakes, we must be talking about that movie. I mean, good God. He's supposed to be this Andy yeah, really. Warhol. He's supposed to be this Andy Warhol kind of villain, and it doesn't make any sense. He electrocutes a shark at one point, and it's supposed to be a parody of an actual uh, artist's expression where they put a dead shark in a pool of water. That's just stupid. And then there's another bit where he's photographing kids crying and stuff because the toys are being burned. He's like, ah, it's a masterpiece. Ah, what the fuck, movie? What the fuck? I was getting Schindler Schindler's List flashbacks at that point. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Me too. That was a better movie. Oh, okay. there was crying for a reason. Okay. Here I'm crying because I'm being in pain. Okay. These are the shots of all the children that are exiting the theater right now. <laughs> My God, that movie deserves zero percent. All, right. all right. The last but not least, let's talk about a sequel, uh, Kronk New Groove, from ten years ago by Disney. Take it away, Matt. <laughs> okay. Now, if you guys know me, there there are pretty obvious reasons why I picked Kronk's New Groove. It's um, animated. No, it's animated. <laughs> so the criteria no, for this for... podcast is going to be animated for him to talk about. Okay, no, no, no. But here's I, I, the... Yeah, yeah, I figured the room. With, um, no, but the thing with Kronk's New Groove is that, um, as you may know, Emperor's New Groove is one of my favorite Disney films ever. Um, and also, I feel like this is one of the greatest animated comedies ever. And it really is interesting with uh, Kronk's New Groove because the concept and the idea is really interesting. Like, one of like everybody who watches it, their favorite aspect is Kronk. So pretty much, why don't why don't we have a spinoff film that features Kronk? And you know, it sounds like a good idea. You know, and and plus the fact like they pretty much have everything set up and ready. This is Kronk's movie, and they even got all the original cast back. They got David Spade, they got John Goodman, they got Eartha Kitt, they got Patrick Warburton. So they're all set to make this movie. That's but because actually... when you make a Disney sequel, everybody sells out except for Eddie Murphy. Oh. But go on. Oh. 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 He sold his soul to that director in orbit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> anyways, oh, no. uh, anyways, um, but the thing is, is that the result did not really go as well. Because here's the thing, um. I understand what it's trying to go with. Like, as I said, like, everything is set up as it should be, but there's just one big problem. It has the right tone that it did with the previous film with Emperor's New Group. It has the same tone, like, and it has the same tempo, and, like, there are some returning gags that they did. But the biggest problem with it is that it they don't have Cusco. 
and you'd think that's not a major big deal. Like they have, you know, they have because they have Kronk now. No, that's not because the thing is, is that Kronk's new groove reminds us of the importance of Cusco. Like, in all honesty, Cusco really made the first film. He's pretty much the reason why, like, it's one of the funniest animated films ever. And, like, and plus the fact that you also got the hard aspect with his relationship with Pacha and stuff like that. But no, Cusco only appears, like, I think at the beginning and only at the end. No, no, he interrupts the movie two times. It's once during Yzma's plan, he's like, it's snake oil, I tell you, snake oil! And then the other time during a crying scene after this big dance number ever between... No, but he does appear in the end. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, the other... Yeah, so, like, it's very brief. And plus the fact, like, with Kronk, I feel like they barely do anything with it. It's mostly the factor that they just fill the re- like they fill the movie with such generic plot lines, and that's where the movie really falls flat. It's mostly like they give Kronk, like um, they try to give him a, a role, like uh, kind of a, a love interest. I think it's Mrs. Birdwell, like with the um, like with the little scouts, and then you also got, and then like the main plot is basically how Kronk always wanted to impress his, like, he pretty much wants to impress his dad, and this is where the movie really falls flat for me, because, like, I've seen it so many times, both before and after, the old cliche of trying to impress the tough dad. Like, it's been it's been done to death so many times. Like, they, I, I've seen that done in, like, the, it's done in The Little Mermaid, it's done in Elf, it's done in Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs. It's done in um, it, it's done in How to Train Your Dragon. Like everybody freaking does it, and like each one, it feels old. Even you know? the Music Man, which is older than all those movies combined. Yeah, even the yeah, even the Music Man. It's such an old like it's just an example of an old cliche, and even some of the jokes they kind of feel flat. Not gonna lie, because a lot of it is re is just taking from the first film because they did a lot of the jokes where um oh oh yeah and also i just realized they also try to give more of a plot line to the to one of the little kid to one of uh pacha's kids like the little boy and like they try to reuse gags like um the angel and devil yeah the yeah they 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 reuse the angel and devil bit and oh my god i think one of the worst aspects honestly like other than the the tough dad plot line is what they did with Eartha Kitt. I don't know why, but they really felt the need to really sexualize Yzma. Didn't they do that in the first movie for like a really short joke? I don't... Perhaps you're expecting this. No! No! Oh, yeah. Ah, yeah, oh, that was just like a... No, but that's just a cute little small thing. This one, they really try to push it. Mm-hmm. Like, I think they're... Like, what I think they're trying to do is that they're really trying to pay homage with Eartha Kitt with the fact that she used to be, um, like, she used to be Catwoman, and the fact that at the end of the movie she turns into a little kitty, but you were just kind of... I thought thought she turned into a bunny at the end. No, it was a little kitty. It was a kitty. No, it was a little kitty. It was a kitty. Actually, I do remember that now when you said that. I I have... Oh, my God. That was... I remember that. What happened to my voice? (laughs) That's my voice? So basically, so basically, the way that you're describing this movie, Matt, it can be something that's like 76 plot points led the big cliche. Yeah. It's, yeah, that's basically. You got trouble, take the T in the R, the, you got a spells reboot. Yep. Yeah, and you know. Uh, like, ah, ah, I was right, I was right, I was right, she turns into a rabbit. Ah. Where? Right there, transforms herself into a rabbit. No! I was right! I no. remember that movie! Oh. No. Yes! Hold on. Wait, which one? Okay. Crocs new yeah! Oh, Crocs new groove! Oh, oh Crocs okay. new groove! No, 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 okay, never mind then. Yeah. Okay. Just, I haven't seen the movie, so like, I wouldn't what? know. No, 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 that's in the first movie. I, yeah. I, was, I was mentioning the first movie, I'm sorry. No, but, no, but like, checking out the, um, the reviews, honestly, I feel a lot, like, they're pretty spot on, like, um, like David Nusser, 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 Nusser of Real Films Reviews, he 
he said that this film proves that Kronk works best in small doses, which is actually kind of true. Um, and then there's also um, uh, Pam Pam Gelman of <laughs> Common Sense Media. Common Sense, Sense Media. Media. <laughs> says, uh, great voice talent, but weak storyline, and frankly, not much groove, which is kind of true. And, like, yeah, and that's the thing, is that it's, honestly, it's kind of, like, overall, it's a rather dull film. I understand what they're going with it, and I'll admit, um, admittedly, I wouldn't really say it's a bad film, it's just... Like, honestly, I feel like it's meh. Like, does this deserve a 0% on Rotten Tomatoes? Um, not really. Like, it's, like, honestly, no. Mostly because, like, there are plenty of other worse sequels. Like, like, I've seen, like, other, other sequels, like, other Disney sequels and other sequels in general. They're much, there are much, much worse than Kronk's new groove. I agree it's not mm. really good, considering, like, the animation is cheaper, and the writing is just downright lazy. But overall, it's just, like, it does have a bit of that heart. Like, I did feel a bit good after watching it, but, like, it's definitely inferior to Emperor's New Groove. Not much laughs. Um, and overall, I th- overall, the biggest problem, not much Cusco. <laughs> what is the worst? His, his one contribution to this film... Yeah? His one contribution to this film, as, as far as my knowledge is, he just interrupts it to do the same funny joke that he did in the first film. There was only one good line he had if I remember correctly it's near the end where they're doing that whole thing with like the many different wives and he comes out of nowhere and drag <laughs> yeah. he's like booyah great way to insert myself in the movie <laughs> come on that yeah. was a, that was at least funny yeah that was great no I think that was the best part of the film when and then, uh, and then, Cusco came out and drag and that then he get the- and then he gets overtaken by a giant tidal wave of nacho cheese for no reason honestly because, uh, honestly, I think that was the only moment when it really felt like Emperor's in the Groove. That's when it really felt great. Too bad that was, like, near the end of the film. It it felt like Emperor's New Groove when the Emperor came in? Well, yeah. No shit. I know. <laughs> well, even though... Uh, I mean, I'm not gonna say it's a great sequel. It's, there's at least one or two jokes that I thought were okay, or a little bit of a chuckle. Like one where he's gonna start a flashback and he uses the film cliche and he pulls it out and turns the projector on and it says stag film or something like that. And it's like, no, no, change the film! And he changes the actual thing. There's another bit where after the end of this really tragic story, he's like, and these mittens are the only thing I have of her! And then it gets knocked into the flames and they burst into the flames. I thought that was actually funny. Yeah. Um, it's, it's a clone. That's really what it is. It's just a straightforward clone with similar beats. Like, Patrick Warburton, he can be funny. I've seen him in The Tick. He's actually the funniest thing in Underdog next to Peter Dinklage. I'm going to admit that right there. He's funny when he's either a secondary character or when he's this complete loony doofus. He's great at these kind of characters. And when he's doing something seriously loony, it works. But to see him dedicating all that just for like an hour and 15 minutes... That's where it falls apart, because he's trying to, again, be like David Spade and do all these crazy uh, kind of things. That's the problem. His comedy is a little slow, and so those jokes have a very slow pace. That's why it worked in the first one, because he was in small doses, and he was mm-hmm. unpredictable. And that's what made it really work so well, because his character is a henchman. He's trying to be serious as a henchman, because it's you know very childlike-like whim to have that as the whole movie... It drags. Yeah. It really, really drags. And again, when he's doing the tick, he's playing it up so seriously, he's going against, like, silly things like uh, a century-year-old villain called the Terror and stuff like that. That's funny because it's so ridiculous, but he plays it so serious, and he has stuff to play off of. Um, When it's just himself, you're just watching Patrick Warburton 
trying. Although I do admit, like I'm thinking it, I, I'm thinking about it. I don't know if the prob, if the actual problem would be Patrick Warburton, mm. or if it's more the writing. I, I'd say maybe a little bit of both, because obviously they are cashing in on the first film. You can tell again, as you said before, there's similar beats, there's similar jokes, similar ideas. So it could be a combination of the two, or maybe just one. That's pretty much how I feel. I don't think Patrick is a bad guy. But with the right vehicle, he can be funny. Yeah. Uh, Peabody and Sherman, for example. Yes. Yes, actually, that's that's a pretty good example, also. And uh, actually, another. Well, actually, now now to realize it, there there is a moment when he actually did have a bigger role, and it actually works out well. Um, believe, uh, some of you might find me crazy for saying this, but. Hoodwink, when he was the wolf. Oh yeah, he actually has a much bigger role. I never like, saw it. I you never it. saw Hoodwink. It's uh, honestly Hoodwink is the best animated film with the worst animation. Mm. It's the best way to put it. Yeah, if anything with uh, that 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 guy that was with the uh, friends with Tom Green, whatever his name was. I, I tend to stay away with, away from. Oh, fun fact, Matt. There was originally going to be a deleted scene where they come across these loony bats, and one of them is this giant, big bat that they get scared of. Oh. The bat's name is Ozzy. Ah. Ah. And he has, like, this, you know, this Roger's like, Grr, watch job. And they're like, ah. <laughs> Wait, are we talking about Hoodwinked, or are we I, talking... I guess... I guess. I mean, no. still Are we back. still talking about Kronk's new groove? Or... I, I, I think we're talking about Patrick Warburton, how he differs from, like, Kronk and other stuff. Oh, uh, okay, 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 okay. Yeah. Andy Dick. That's what his name is. <laughs> oh, Andy Dick. Oh, yeah, he's the villain in the movie. Spoiler alert. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> Spoilers? What is like spoilers him. we speak of? If people are watching this podcast, <laughs> they expect spoilers. At least he's not that bad on this one. Okay. So, one, so, so once again, I'm looking at directors once again, for some strange fucking reason. Um, it's a it's a duo, uh, directing thing. It, it was um, Elliot M. Boar, Saul Andrew Binkoff, I think. They've done. Yep. Binkoff. Oh, oh, <laughs> oh, blink Binkoff. Blinkoff. Sorry, Blinkoff, not Bink. Blinkoff. Um, they directed, uh... This is a blink off, okay? <laughs> they, they have directed, they've directed two other things together. They've direct, uh. they directed Winnie the Pooh, Springtime with Rue. And another interesting thing that features the word groove. It's a show, animated series, that lasted one season on Teletoon in Canada called Spring. Spy Groove. Spy Groove. Spy Groove. Uh, Hold on, let me check that out. Uh, uh, and it only aired in United States at MTV for six episodes. Uh, so they directed episodes of the show, I guess, which is weird. They, they kind of remind me of uh, Miller and Lore with. Um, That other show. Only not not sucking. <laughs> I should not say those two names, because Morgan, that's just like the words that sets him off. That's his, They're hacks. That's his, his kryptonite. They're hacks. His kryptonite. They're doing the same shtick again and again, and you're falling for but, it. Yeah, I know. The animation looks kind of like up the... Wake America. If you think it's funny, good for you, but... I'm sorry, there's only so much self-aware humor you can do. Again, and again, and again, and again. It's like a cable that's sweaty that someone keeps unraveling, and they keep knitting, and knitting, and knitting, and knitting, and knitting, and knitting, and knitting. I'm going to mute myself for a second so you guys can talk. And knitting, and knitting, and knitting. Sorry about that. I should not say those two words ever again. But I just wanted to say that because... 
I just thought that was interesting that they do Spy Groove, and then later on they do a movie called Crunch New Groove. So it's just like, it comes full circle. Like, hey, we did this show back in 2000. Hey, now we're doing a movie that has Groove in the title. That's pretty sweet, man. Yeah. No, but uh, honestly... They're going... I, I like... Yeah, I would say I disagree with the... So yeah, basically, I just want to say I disagree with the zero percent rating. I would go probably fifty percent. Oh wow! Because wow! Because yeah, like yeah, like because like I said, there are definitely much worse sequels out there. I mean, like oh yeah. In fact, I'm uh, as we're recording this, I am gonna see one. So. <laughs> I'm surprised for this you didn't you didn't watch Mulan too. Uh, the only other zero percent on there with uh, a plot line that takes a fun action comedy for the whole, whole family and replaces it with, with a completely meaningless romantic comedy romantic comedy plot. Yeah. Well, no, like well, Kronk's new groove is much more interesting to talk about, and besides, it could have been worse. Could have been what? Well, like uh, Hunchback Two, Cinderella Two. Uh, th- there are plenty of others. Ah, oh, yeah. that's good. That's good. That's good. That's good. <sighs> yes. Crapper. Oh. A second here. I wanted to. Do 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 do. Let's change this to that. Set that timer just to, for convenience sake, and he's Cliff is freaking amazing. That does not give a clue for the next episode. No, no, we're not talking about comic strip movies yet. We're talking, we'll talk about films based on comic strips in November. But next time on Cinema Royale, we are going to and knitting and knitting and knitting and knitting and knitting. Are you good? Man, they made one hell of a scarf. Are, are you good, Morgan? I'm sorry. I promise I won't say those two names ever again. It's okay. I, I, I could have okay. Sorry. Sorry, I just had to compare something. Um, so next time we're actually going to revisit a old topic from the past, and um, we're going to do a sequel, of course. It's been a while since we've done a sequel topic. Um, so we're doing video games based on uh, video... No, films based on video games. I'm sorry. Video game is based on video games? <laughs> Shut up. Shut up. <laughs> Shut up. <coughs> films based on video games 2. Um, since recently, actually, Hit, uh, Hitman Agent 47 came out, and that has rotten reviews. <laughs> Figure we revisit it, talk about other video game movies, and I'll definitely talk, a- talk about DOA Dead or Alive. Oh, damn it. I was going to take that one. I have it on DVD, and I'm definitely going to watch it and talk about that. But, we got a range of screening then. Yeah, I know. Um, but I know that it's going to be like, why Why even watch a movie where the women fight each other but not in jello? Or pudding. What's the point? <laughs> Oh, they don't fight in je- in Jello. They carry the Jello. Oh, <laughs> it's dead or alive. I had to. I will defeat you after I eat this. Mm, because the Jello is good. <laughs> Jake, you fell out all bridge. Wiggle, wiggle. <laughs> wiggle, wiggle, Jello. Yes, and we'll have 
hopefully a guest next time. Uh, I know we had, like James said, Brandon Nichols also knows the hardcore kid, but he had to stay at a friend's house, blah, blah. We have him scheduled for another episode, which is uh, in October. We talk about Disney films, so he'll come back. So next time we're going to have our good friend Daniel Swallow, also known as Sonic Guru in the episode, to talk about video game movies with us. Oh, I got one more. <laughs> Bordering Pops of Death! Eye gouge, eye gouge. <laughs> you want to see my yellow boom pop? Here you go! <laughs> Lawsuit! Oh my god. We, we gotta make that happen. I'll... <laughs> we do a Kickstarter, do an Indiegogo. I don't care. I want to see that Jello Puddin' Pop Ninjas must happen. Jello <laughs> Pop <laughs> You mean like a... Roofy Jello. You mean like a video... <laughs> Roofy Jello. Ooh. <laughs> what? God. <laughs> So <laughs> it, 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 instead of thud butt, it's thud bottom, as in fruit of the bottom of yogurt. <laughs> <laughs> what is going on now? So, thanks for watching this intensely long episode once again. It's and Morgan's always on. It's gonna be a long episode, which I'm not gonna. <laughs> Count them out because it's always good to have more men. You put this on to yourself, Mike. <laughs> They're the best. I, I'm I'm default. I'm default with this. I'm sorry. So next time it'll probably be a shorter episode. Who knows? We'll see. Um, comment below. What is the hated movie? What's the worst movie you ever seen? Whether it's zero percent or not. Um, make sure you like this video. Subscribe for more content. I have plenty more to come from, especially with the podcast here, and. This has been Cinema Royale. Good night. See you later, dudes. Ciao for now, y'all. Delayed reaction, man. And <laughs> maybe. <laughs>